this is Mark. Hello, Mark. It's Mark Wilding, calling from Esquire. Hey, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thanks. How are you doing? Good. Have you still got time to chat now? Yes, you bet. Okay, great. Um, well, um, as I said, I'm writing a feature about um, Flat Earth, the Flat Earth community, uh, particularly here in the UK. But um, uh, I understand it's, uh, it's well, much more well-established um, over in the US. And... Um, well, yeah. in large part, it seems from the people I've spoken to, um, you are sort of uh, responsible really for, for many people sort of coming to flat earth theory in the last couple of years. And so that's why I've got in touch. Cool. Um, yeah. And I wondered um, whether, first of all, we might be able to start by just going back a little bit. And maybe you could tell me about um, before you produced uh, flat earth clues or sort of tell me how it was that you first became um, became interested uh, in these kind of ideas. Sure, you bet. I first got into it in the summer of 2014. I had looked at a whole bunch of conspiracies over a uh, previous couple decades and, and thought I pretty much knew it all. And I was, if there's a term for it, conspiracy bored. Where it's like, all right, I've seen it. You know, if, if you can name a conspiracy, I'd probably heard of it and had an opinion on it. And okay. everybody in the conspiracy world knows about Flat Earth. I mean, everybody in the world knows about Flat Earth not just conspiracy people and everybody hates it and so <laughs> it's like me too it's like oh that piece of crap i'm not i'm not looking at it and then finally in the summer of 2014 it uh, it came across my desk and there it was and it's like you know what I, 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 fine I'll, I'll i'll take a look just for the heck of it and sorry when you say it came across your <coughs> desk you know do you mean that um, it was just you thought oh it's about time i looked into this or was there another particular reason? no no i was rummaging around social media and was in youtube and i mean i had a youtube channel but i really wasn't doing much with it and there was a YouTube video on the side by a guy named Cesar, C-A-E-S-A-R, space, the space between Say and Czar. And it was a German guy who was talking about flight routes in the Southern Hemisphere, about how they didn't make sense. And okay. it was completely in, in German, so I, I didn't know, it, but it was subtitled. And I was like, uh, but it's like, all right, but I kind of got the visuals. And at the end, he was basically saying that the, the flights don't make sense unless the, unless the world map is wrong, unless it's actually this, this big flat disk. And I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, you know, I'll, 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 but when I remember, I remember when I clicked on it, I was actually physically embarrassed to click on it. And I thought that was really odd for me because, you know, being a, a tech guy my whole life, the, you know, I've gone to some pretty, pretty weird places on the internet, you know, places you don't, <laughs> you, you don't want to go, places you don't want to click on. And yet this thing was actually embarrassing. I, I was actually, I was really surprised. And so, after that, there was another video that was, I was kind of poking around in, it, in the area, and there wasn't much out there in 2014. And there was a guy uh, from Montreal, Canada, who was talking about, he went to a high-level NASA party in the mid-2000s, and early, you know, between 2000 and 2010, and that one of these high-level NASA guys was saying to him that GPS didn't work in the Southern Hemisphere, really, because, because especially in Antarctica. It doesn't even work at all in Antarctica because, uh, because the world's flat. And, I was going to, and, and he's saying this sober, you know, it, his girlfriend in Montreal, you know, put him on a couch and he was talking to the camera. I'm going, you know, this is, an, this, this is a real, you know, I'm thinking a Twilight Zone movie, you know, movie of the week type thing. I'm going, okay. All right, you know what? I'm going to see if I can knock this thing out. Because if you're a conspiracy guy, there's some some you love and there's some you hate. And the ones you yeah. hate, you, you kind of try to debunk it them yourself. I mean, a lot of conspiracy guys are really good at debunking stuff because you know it's not like we believe in everything. So I tried to, I sat down and said, okay, I can knock this thing out over a weekend. Shouldn't be a problem. Nine months later, <laughs> I'm sitting there in front of my computer just banging my head on the keyboard going this cannot be I couldn't I could not at at nine months later February of 2015 I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore I couldn't do it there wasn't there was not enough there so and I consider myself a very creative problem solver maybe not the fastest in the world but I'll mull something over long enough to where I I think I can get it so I said, okay, so February 10th, I remember, you know, middle of the night, I woke up and I said, I had that Jerry Maguire moment. I, I said, okay, I'm going to go the other way on this. I'm going to say 
it's not a globe. And, and I don't use the term round. It's one of those pet peeves in the, in the community. You say globe or sphere or ball, but round can also be a dinner plate or a dining room table, you know, because sure, technically yeah. it's also two dimensional. So yeah. I put a, uh, I made, I, I got up and I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make a series of videos. I don't know exactly where, where I'm going to go with this. So I just made an introduction to the flat earth clues and I put it out to the internet. I say, go internet hive mind, help me out here. Tell me where I'm wrong. Somebody call me up. Somebody email me, which is why I was, you know, I was dumb enough to put out my phone number and my email address <laughs> and I'll, all my contact on my phone. I can't even answer my phone anymore. It just it will not stop ringing. So. I put it out there, but, and I, but, so you don't. Sorry, just to jump in, but you see, you don't answer it these days. Presumably, you did to start with, and was it? I did. Sort of fascinated with your idea, or yeah. were they kind of supportive, or were they? Yeah, they were. They were almost. This is rubbish. No, they were almost all supportive. They, uh, right. well, because remember, trolls. They don't I mean, just garden variety trolls. They like to stay anonymous, so mm -hmm. they'll put comments in the section. But remember, they're anonymous. Uh, they rarely will spoof an email and send you an email, and rarely will they call and every once in a while yeah sure like i just got a voicemail just now um rarely will they call and uh, uh but if they do usually they're drunk <laughs> they're really <laughs> okay. i mean i get the weirdest voicemails from patrols it's like they'll be like it's like three in the morning it's like hey you're the guy flat earth ah, click <laughs> you know, dial tone and and then that's it so anyway um so yeah those first calls were coming in and People were really supportive. They're going, this is really interesting stuff, man. Tell me more. And, and then I started getting subject matter experts that were calling up from various branches of the military and engineers and air traffic controllers, everybody that was sort of related to it in some way. And they said, you know what? You may be on to something because of what this is. And I, and then almost immediately, like there was a, from your neck of the woods, there was a London book company, a little small publisher called me up and said, hey, why don't we... Uh, 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 collaborate. Why don't you send, start sending me, uh, you know, the transcripts of your clues, and we'll turn it into a book. I said, okay. Uh, and then uh, the interviews started coming, where there was, you know, small, start out with small, small podcasts, and then it started ratcheting up because people listen, you know, podcasts listen to other people, and it just kind of works its way up. And like Coast to Coast called me, I think three months in, and. I, which was, I was going, really? Why are you guys calling me? And they said, oh yeah, we heard you on such and such. And, and they, the, the producer was getting really angry because I didn't have a book. I didn't have a DVD. And she, she goes, she goes, wait, what's your website? And I go, look, I don't have anything. I just have these <laughs> stupid clues. She goes, why am I talking to you? And I go, I don't know. You called me. <laughs> and she goes, all right, give me the nickel tour. You got five minutes. And I go, okay, here. Da, 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 da. And she goes, all right, you're on next week. I go, okay and apparently that was a big deal okay. so uh that's how that's the kind of long version but that's how i got into it and now here we are three years after the clues first started and we already finished our national conference in raleigh uh you, you there's a conference out in your neck of the woods even though they're not really publicizing it uh, uh in like two days yeah, well, well, I'm, I'm going yeah that's oh you're gonna go that. oh good i'm glad yeah, somebody's why, um... freaking going <laughs> they, they well no because they weren't even allowing um, press passes the last time I checked they 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 were the organizers were not really keen on how the American media was covering ours and so they thought they could control it and I said control the media yeah good luck so whatever if if they want that's no what they yeah want. I'm gonna go I think um I yeah I don't know I can't speak for them but I th I think um yeah for one reason or another they didn't decide to pursue um sort of attracting the media but yeah. I was in touch with the organisers uh, myself and they, Good. Yeah, they said they were happy for me to come along so I'm gonna go so uh, are I'm you I t it doesn't sound as if you're gonna be there no I am not gonna be there I was invited I don't probably I probably shouldn't get into exactly why I am not going. <laughs> But okay. uh, it, it was mostly because they wanted to control the media to the point where they wanted to approve who the speakers talked to. And yeah, I, okay. I said, uh, why? why? It's a social media world. Why would you ever do that? I go, this is, that's how we got to this place. You wouldn't even have a freaking conference if it wasn't for the media to, to date. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. So um, the next conference, so there's a Canadian conference coming up in August. Uh, I'm going up, in fact, next week, a week, for, well, this Sunday, I'm flying up to Toronto. Uh, there's a U.S. documentary that is going to be released at the film festival in Toronto, the documentary film festival Hot Docs. 
which is great. It's called Behind the Curve. I have not seen it yet. <laughs> I'm okay. we're, I'm getting a private screening. I hope it turned out well because I was there for about 75% of the shooting. Uh, and then the U.S. conference is going to be in Denver in November. So, yeah, it's been a wild ride so far and completely unsolicited. I I hated Flat Earth when I started. I still am not a huge fan of it other than I think it's the absolute truth. Uh, but it, it generates so much polarization out there. You either love it or you hate it, which is a producer's dream, but nightmare for me sometimes. So, yeah, to, to go back, you said um, you were a conspiracy guy. So what... Do, what, what, what um... How would you characterize your beliefs back then before you uh, before you start digging into flat earth? I mean, what kind of conspiracies were you into or weren't weren't um, you into? All what was the your kind of worldview. The, the, mostly the American ones. Uh, I mean, I, I I grew up on a really rural island in the northwest of the United States, where uh, so I was really really sheltered when I grew up. And I didn't believe really that even uh, powers of the, the the ruling authority even lied for, for any reason. I literally, until I went to university, I did not think. It's like I thought there was a wonderful, beautiful world. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, dude, nothing bad ever happened to me for whatever reason. I just, I just, you know, again, when you're growing up on an island, you, know, it, it, you tend to be I, cut off from that, that sort of thing. And then I get to university, and it's like, wait a minute. These people, I, and then I made the mistake of going to JFK in the theater, like opening weekend. And you know Oliver Stone's opus, and it was it was amazing. And I was going, "Holy smokes, what's happening out there?" You know, and so I got into those. Uh, you know, the the like you know Pearl Harbor and nine eleven and JFK and the moon landing and the, the big American ones. And then I I started looking at at other at other things that are out there, basically questioning the the status quo and and the the saying that history is written, written by the winners. That's that's not the best one. The best one is actually said by Napoleon, where he said, "History is just lies that are agreed upon." Uh, I thought, oh, that, that's actually pretty true because you get in a meeting. Because I've been in in small meetings, you know, corporate meetings and um, uh, association meetings and stuff like that, where you, you know, it's, it's like you know, what they don't know won't hurt them. So let's mm. just spin this in the way everybody does it to some degree. When you get and you get any power corrupts, that's what it does, and. So I, I was into it, but it for me, it was just kind of added depth to the world. I didn't wear tin hats and hide, you know, behind closed windows and, and anything like that. It was just that I looked at the world with some skepticism. The, uh, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, trust everyone, but count your change. And okay. so that's what I was kind of into. But I, I looked at everything like, like anything, you know, I, I'd pretty much tapped out of, of original conspiracies there's been nothing out there recently i was like yeah fine you know there's roswell and area 51 and all this other fun stuff but there was nothing that so what do you what, what do you think about roswell and area 51 that kind of thing uh i believe in uh, what i try to do let, let, let me frame it i because of my training and my career choices i became very empathetic meaning i could put myself in other people's shoes so i believe in the greater good I always have, uh, which is you know, do you know the stupid Spock saying you know needs the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one right that you can't you can't put a price on human life of course you can the American the Americans have done it pretty much in every single war we've ever had mm. starting from, from Revolutionary War all the way you know the Spanish War the Mexican War everything we've ever done we've done for the greater good uh, are there some atrocities committed sure of course there are. Um, when it comes to so when it comes to little things, let's say uh, uh, some sort of advanced aircraft does crash in Roswell, uh, you know, do you cover it up? Yes, you do. Did the uh, colonel was it a full bird colonel the, the 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 head of that particular military base? Did he get overzealous and say yeah, you know, because the war was over and for a lot of the guys they were disappointed that the war was over and like mm -hmm. this guy, and it's like hey, I captured a spaceship, let's call the freaking press <laughs> because <laughs> because things worked slower back then. You know, he didn't the chain of command he didn't break the chain of command, but why would you ask the Pentagon if I can talk sure, to the press yeah. about it? And so the Pentagon calls him up and says, dude, shut up, start backpedaling right now. Now. 
Um, but we all know there's an Area 51. And you get, I mean, look, there's secret military bases. Of course they're going to be. That's why they're out there, to be secret. And, you know, there's nerds that are mad. It's like, you should show us what's inside. It's like, do you not know what classified documents and classified material is? So, yeah, yeah. do I believe in Roswell? Yeah, of course I do. Um, uh, it's it, it, was, it was too... The, I, I'm a big believer in good plot lines. I'm a, I'm a huge movie snob, and I hate bad writing. And that writing was spot on, in, in my opinion, because that's exactly what that general would have done. And that's exactly what that farmer would have done. And it's like, get this off my property. You guys crashing stuff here? If you ever seen the movie, Roswell, which was a made-for-TV movie in the, oh, I think it was like 1990 or something like that. Oh, it, was, it, it was great. It was absolutely... <laughs> It was it was great because everyone that did what they were doing they they acted naturally. At no time did I say that's not what that guy would have done. The the military because remember we're talking phone lines back then. There wasn't even it was there wasn't even television at the time. So it, it, it took a few days before the Pentagon had to find out through newspapers what had happened out in New Mexico. So by the time they got it, it's like, call call somebody, get on a freaking plane, get out there and clean this up as fast as you can. It's like, oh yeah, it's a weather balloon. It's tiny little weather balloon. Like, what? <laughs> it's not, the thing was... But, uh, how does this fit with your sort of, um, the, um, you know, the theory oh, how does it flat earth? the flat earth clues? I mean, so did this kind of craft, do you believe it came from you know, outside our... Uh, uh, that's or? a tough, it's a tough question. Do I think it came from Venus or Mars or some planetary body? No. Uh, do I think it existed? Yes, I, yes, I do. And I've said this on many things. Like, look, uh, for way before I was in the flat earth, uh, somebody I watched, uh, in fact, it was from your neck of the woods. Some guy at the end of this little documentary said, you want to see something weird? He goes, get some night vision and start looking up in the sky. It's like, okay, I'll take that challenge. So I went out and bought some Rus Russian night vision binoculars and, and go, you know, started laying on my back in Colorado. It, you know, we had a pretty clear sky out there and it was high altitude and started looking at the sky. And I'll be darned if there weren't a lot of stuff that was flying around that was not satellites. Oh, yeah. But what I didn't think for a second, and you can see it anytime you want, and it doesn't matter where you are, you can see this. Just, you need night vision, though, to do it. It's kind of like okay. the, those glasses from They Live. Uh, there's lots of stuff because people forget that uh, cars, for example, I know I ramble sometimes, cars work great with their headlights off, right? So you, you, everyone thinks, oh, you only see UFOs because they're these bright sparkling lights. It's like, no, they just turn their lights off, but they're still flying around up there because they just don't yeah, want yeah. <laughs> to be seen. But do okay. they, do I think just about every conspiracy that you can think of dovetails into the whole flat enclosed world thing quite nicely because most of them are physically inside this flat enclosed world and as far as anything regarding aliens or spaceships well okay are they inside with us are they trapped in here with us or do they have access to whatever's outside of it don't don't really know i mean you could go either way because i believe in older civilizations i i believe that yeah you know our unbroken history goes back so far but look there's all sorts of fun stuff out there that is tied to older things you know the sunken cities off of india sunken cities off of japan bosnian pyramids bimini road take your pick how old really are the pyramids uh so are they i i don't even consider them inter interdimensional as much as i do i consider them just older versions of us sure so, so and um i wanted to ask you about um about your concept of god um, because yeah. I was, um, I watched uh, the series, and um, mm -hmm. I was, um, it was my introduction to uh, flat Earth theories, and I was um, surprised when I got to chapter ten. I believe it's chapter ten, and I uh, heard your, um, you basically reveal it. It seemed to be building up to something, and then you talk about intelligent design and um, this idea of um, yeah, uh, yeah, God, and, uh, and and so I just wondered what that what that means to you, what your thinking is now in terms of a creator and uh, and religion and that kind of thing. I grew up in a strong born again Christian home, and again on a rural island. But when I got to university, that all got uh, faded away pretty quickly because there were so many new ideas it's like wait there's other religions out there because yeah, when you're inside yeah, yeah. one it's like you don't talk about buddhism and hinduism and judaism and that sort of thing and for a number of decades i fell away from the church really entirely especially if you get into tech because then you're you're into tech and science and and you know then that's a whole nother level because science really is its own religion 
and it is now anyway. And so, but when I got into this, it kind of snapped me back. Now, do I go to church on Sundays? No. Uh, but do I, did I come back to, to spirituality? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because, it, because it's not an organic structure. You know, you can, you can pass off if you're telling kids when they're six years old that, oh yeah, this world is this tiny little rock that's flying through space and it's just part of this organic system. Okay. That's fine. You know, people will believe that though. They believe the world that is presented to them, hmm. but when you go ahead and say, oh yeah, by the way, it might be this flat enclosed disc that looks like a snow globe, petri dish, pizza box, whatever you want. It's a structure. Well, then it's like, okay, then it was built by somebody. And then you can really only go two ways. One way is an advanced, highly advanced civilization compared to us, which can deal with things on a massive scale compared to us, or the divine. And at that point, you're kind of splitting hairs. Because really, if a giant golden spaceship came out and landed on the ground and, and pe whatever came out was better looking than us, it could be even glowing a little bit, there's going to be a lot of people looking at them as godlike beings, demigods. Sure, yeah. So it, for me, I, it definitely snapped me back to spirituality as far as, look, there's definitely a higher power out there. Now, did God subcontract out the work? Eh, maybe. Uh, but as one of the few questions, the first questions you would ask, whoever it is, which is if someone did land, they'd say, are you God? And, and if they said no, the next question would be, do you have God's phone number? And then, you, then you'd go from there because people would say, oh, be, at the very least, they are a level closer to the ultimate meaning of the universe than we are. So, but yeah, and so, but, and, and really, as I was making the clues, I started to get emails pretty quickly and the Christian community really jumped on me and said, look, you're dancing around this. You better get into, you know, you, you're going to have to address it one way or the other. And he's like, well, you're right. I, I can't, I can't keep this completely because I, I, I did, I want to cast a broad net. I didn't want to, to make it come off as a, a sermon. And yeah. when I, when I, you know, when I put it out there, I, I tried to do exactly that to the point where even when I did the Tower of Babel story, I didn't mention the Tower of Babel by name because the Christian community, of course, is going to know where it's from. And other people are going to be like, wait, where have I heard this before? And so it was kind of a, a clever way of, of putting it in there without offending anybody and, and coming off as preachy. And I, I thought it turned out okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, um, what what was your stance on evolution before you kind of came to the flat Earth uh, realization? Were you uh, were you sort of on board with intelligent design before flat Earth? Lived, the, or was flat Earth the thing that kind of? I no, I believed. I believe kind of a mixed thing. I believed in evolution, but not from a mainstream science point of view. More of an intelligent design version of evolution, which is between the breaks of history that we have here in this world it's kind of like you're you're if you're talking about because i again i do not think this is a one-off i don't think we're the only because a, a structure like this you wouldn't just do it for one person and it's not disposable i mean it could be i suppose but why would you uh in those breaks between civilizations then you can start tinkering with things all right let's mess with the continents and let's mess with the air conditioning system and the water system and magma system and yeah definitely the life forms we, you know, what what is this life form is going to be based off of so do i yeah do i think that millions of years of evolution happen naturally eh, i mean yeah if you condense time down and just cranked up the the speed thing sure but i think it was i i don't think it was just a scientific version of evolution i think that it was definitely manipulated because look, look what's art imitates life and life imitates life we're doing genetic manipulation right now and if we can do it, then why wouldn't a higher civilization have done it? In fact, we, if we can think of it, chances are it's already been done. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, you, you said there wasn't much out there when you sort of started doing your research and you were trying to debunk flat earth theory to start. Right, with. right. So when you produced flat earth clues, what kind of work or experts did you refer to when kind of coming up with your arguments? That's just it. I didn't. I I I had really no one to turn to because I, I wasn't going to turn to Cesar because he was German. Uh, <laughs> there, the the Matt Matt Boyland actually he and I spoke almost immediately. The the guy from Canada. Uh, he he was the first person to ever call me, and he called me by the time I got to Clue Eight. He was calling me. He goes, "I've been trying to call you since Clue, or I've been trying to text you since Clue Two. Why have you been answering my texts?" And I said, "Because I don't have a cell phone." 
So, so did you say that's Matt Boylan? Yeah, Matt Matt Boylan. Uh, his um his channel is called the NASA Channel, and he okay. his his alias is really I'm not making this up. His his alias is Math Powerland. That's his name. That's what he goes okay. by. It's like, but his I think his license says Matt Boylan B O Y L N. Anyway. Um, but we, we talked for a few hours and it's like, eh, he kind of rambles incoherently sometimes. So it's like, ah, I'm just, I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, so there really wasn't that many people to, to go to. I, I did at one point, I'm not kidding you at the end of 2014, I actually applied and got a membership to one of the flat earth societies. This one was done uh, by a guy that was living out in Hong Kong. He was a, a British guy at a, in, in Hong Kong. And was that, uh, Daniel Shenton? Yes. Yes, it was. As a matter of fact, I've still got that card lying around. And he, and this that was the one where Thomas Dolby was the first member, the, yeah, that, yeah, that particular yeah. one. And that one disbanded for a while because they had an internal struggle where there was another guy, an American out of Thailand. Everybody's everywhere. And he, his name was Eric Dubay, and he broke away from that one and took so many members with him that the, the core thing just kind of collapsed. So, but anyway, but they, they didn't help me much because when I went there, there were dedicated trolls that were just kind of hanging around, uh, like, like hanging around at the front of the velvet rope saying, there's nothing to see here. It's all a joke. Go away. And that just intrigued me. I was like, going, why would there be people trolling this tiny little corner of, I mean, look, if you want to troll things, you could troll all day on until your fingers fall off on YouTube. Literally, yeah. you, you, there's no limit to the amount of times you can troll on YouTube. So why would you be trolling these guys? And I, I realized that they, in fact, they were so prevalent that it was tough to get any traction at all in there, even talking about it. I mean, actually, really talking about it. So I just said, okay, warning to anyone that's, that's doing this. I, I was so disheartened by it. I said, okay, I'm just going to do my own research. And where I kind of stumbled into it was when I looked at Admiral Byrd. That was the big thing that got me that got me really motivated because I remembered Admiral Byrd from Hollow Earth. Mm. You, again, if you get into conspiracies and you go into the fringe stuff, you'll hear about Hollow Earth, which is, you know, that the Earth is hollow and there's another journey to the center of the Earth civilization inside there. And Admiral Byrd supposedly found it in, you know, secret journal, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at that and then I noticed really quickly that that's when his career changed was after that little story the part that most people do not know is that he spent the rest of his life down in antarctica and i thought that was really really fascinating so i kind of dug into it and dug into it. it's like and it's like he never left he literally spent the rest of his life down there flying around in planes looking for something and then you know we got lucky with that great cbs footage from that affiliate where you know they he was interviewed in 1954 and, uh, yes, he, yes. and he was talking about Antarctica. I was going, well, this is this is great. I mean, the quality was good. It was it was obviously straight from the studio tape, and I don't know who released it, but it was but it was fantastic. And then somebody finally copyrighted it later, but who cares? And that was when I got into it. Really, it's like because there were things. Remember, I, I love good writing. I when when there was a plot hole there. And it was a really, really glaring one, which is, you know, here he is amping up everybody to to go down to Antarctica. And there's all these countries there and they're going to make money. And then the whole thing shuts down without any fanfare. Nobody discusses it. There's no newspaper headlines. It's just done. It's like they just put a big padlock on on any organizations going to Antarctica. It's going why 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 would you do that and then you know then i started connecting the dots and yeah i made a, a a leap of faith in there and but i at the same time while i was doing this while i was doing this big thought experiment and building this thing in my head i because i was trying okay how would i build the world and how would i hide it if i found it if any one of those things would have gone in a different direction I would have said, okay, well, there's, there's, there's massive inconsistencies and, and I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do this anymore, but it was the exact opposite. Everything that they did was, would have been something I would have done. Uh, and I could, in fact, I couldn't have, I couldn't come up with a better idea at the time. Now, some people said, oh no, you tell the population, oh, you do this. It's like, no, no, you don't. It's like they learned from Roswell. People were freaking out just over a single spaceship. You're going to tell the general population, that, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> the Earth might not be a globe anymore. They're not going to risk that. So mm. it was it was fantastic. And so it, uh, that was a it was just part of a, a great journey. 
Um, you mentioned um, the uh, the Flat Earth Society that um, that you joined at one stage, and um, mm -hmm. you know, I, well, I actually got in touch with um, Eric Dubay and um, said I was going to the convention, and he, you know, he seemed. Um, he wasn't very positive about the UK convention, basically. Right. And the more people I speak to, the more it seems that there is um, a fair amount of... Dissension in the ranks? Dis yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wonder if maybe you could just address that. For oh, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Why it's... do you think that is the case? Competition, mostly. Uh, it's look at, you, want, you want a great little uh, version of it. Look at the movie The Band Played On which was a story about how all the scientists were fighting over who was going to release the first AIDS treatment vaccine. <laughs> you know, you're thinking it's like, hey, why, why don't you just release it? You know, and but no, they were fighting over who gets credit for developing. In fact, it was the, the test. That's what they were fighting over. It was like they were fighting over just the test to detect it. And because you know, they had no idea at the time back then. But that's yeah. and, and, but that's kind of what we're talking about here. Eric Dubay. Oh, Lord. I, we're, I don't want to spend too much time on Eric Debay. He is an American in Thailand who found out about Flat Earth from a guy in Britain. And he got into it. And he was... He, look, look, there's personality types, uh, all different kinds and flavors. And he's one of those that does not play well with others. He doesn't. He, he He's allied with no one. And he, 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 along with several other people, is like, no, I'm the originator. I'm the originator. And when, in fact, we even did, for example, the, when we did the conference in Raleigh last year, he was invited. Absolutely. I'm like, look, he was one of those guys. Like, why not invite him? He was, he was there back in the beginning. And he said, I can't go, but I endorse the conference. And then he got on an interview a few months later and says, I condemn the conference and everybody's there is working for the government. And of course, he doesn't believe that everyone there is working for the government. He just doesn't want any competition. So it's like, okay, fine. Um, but there's not that most of the most of the community is pretty civil. You know, there's a few people out there, but it's again, it's all competition. That's all it is. There's it's all ego. There's nothing. It's not like there's something sinister happening there. It's it's because uh, it's so new. It's kind of like a, uh, a, a a gold rush in some ways. I mean, look what people will do in any industry, you know, for, for in the spirit of competition and in business and entertainment, in sports, people will do a lot of things. And Eric was, is no different. Uh, but he's, he's the, um, the rarity. And in his case, he got, I, I believe in karma. I'm a huge believer in it. And he got smacked down for hate speech because one of his side little things is he targets demographic groups, one in particular, uh, which I won't go into here very much, and he he, he promotes hate speech, and YouTube destroyed his well, channel. He's, he's a Holocaust denier, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, so where do you stand on that? I mean, so was, you know, I guess you would call that a conspiracy. It um, is a conspiracy. A <sighs> it's it's tough is for me. something you buy into? No, nah, not necessarily, because, uh, okay, for different reasons. Okay, one... Let me clarify real quick. I, it, when you're into flat earth, you're truly a flat earther. It opens your mind up to just about everything. So you're not, I can't even shoot down conspiracies, any conspiracy at first glance anymore, because how can I? It'd be hypocritical for me to do it because I'm a, look, I'm a if, if I start my day with flat earth, how can I condemn you? You could literally come to me and say, yeah, I know a guy that swears that, that Elvis had Bigfoot's baby. And I'd be, well, normally I'd be like, you oh, know, get out of here. Now I'd be like, you know what? I'll give you a few minutes. What do you got? Why not? <laughs> sure. I mean, it's, it's insane, but I cannot literally in good conscience say that, that it's, it's crazy out, out of the gate. When it comes to the whole Holocaust things, Look, everybody's going to pad, everybody pads the numbers, whether it's a studio, Hollywood studio, when they're releasing a movie, or it's a sports guy, you know, they're trying to hype somebody coming out of college, or whatever it is. It, yeah, numbers can be hyped. Do do I think the Holocaust happened? Yes, I do. Uh, mostly because of uh, the German mindset. I, I came from uh, a, a strong German family. And I can tell you right now that, the, you know, everything, you know, for a purpose and people say, oh, no, Holocaust didn't happen. It's like, okay, then why did the Jewish people have their own camps? Everybody else was kind of mixed, right? The Americans and, and the British, and, you know, they had, they had their own you know, camps, but the Jewish people had their own. 
and the there was a there was a movie it was a remake of it uh, I, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head uh there was a whole bunch of heavy heavy hitters in it though um but it was about uh, a jewish team an israeli team that was that was going after uh um uh a camp commander and they were trying to arrest him it was like in the 60s and okay. but but the movie was in the 60s it was recent uh, helen Mirren was in it just as well and he, the the line was and I don't want to get into it too much, but the line was and it was a, again it was, a, it was all Jewish production, where the German officer, a former German officer, was trying to taunt the Israelis. He was going, he's going a thousand prisoners, four guards per thousand. <laughs> he goes, he goes, and no one ever overran the camps. He goes, why do you think that happened? He goes because because of pacifism. That and so and that and he was trying and he and he really did get them then up and he was going yes that, you know that's if you want to know why they had their own camps that was exactly why because they they were really not inclined to fight back and I felt bad but I was like Ugh. so sorry that's my little thing no <laughs> I asked the question so I yeah. appreciate you answering yeah. um, I um I find that the, the people I speak flat Earth clues comes up so much in conversations about um, about this whole community and it's often people's starting point and you know you, you said um, there was so little out there beforehand I mean has it taken you aback by how influential it's turned out to be uh, a little bit because uh, we, again, the the initial the like anything it, aren't most of the 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 big things happen by accident. You know, there's so many Hollywood productions that it's like they're complete happenstance, and they, they become you know like a change of actors or change of this. In my case, literally, the clues was a, a cry for help more than anything else, which was a putting out there saying, okay. I can't get to sleep anymore until I figured this this out one way or the other. Can somebody help me? But uh, and again, I didn't I didn't invent flat Earth. Obviously, flat Earth's been around for a long time, and there was stuff before me. You know, there was stuff. Eric had his stuff two months out before mine, and Matt had his stuff uh, quite a bit before mine. However, it wasn't easy to digest. So all I did was make the dummies guide for flat earth that's all i did i made it palatable to i made i literally boiled it down and it was strictly because of my career choice uh i trained people in proprietary software for years and it was dry proprietary it was time and attendance software and so i had to train blue collar people on this time, this time tracking software and i had to come up with my own way of teaching classrooms these these things and what and that's how i applied it to flat earth i mean you go into the flat earth clues there's no math i didn't even cover the curvature of the earth, the earth formula in it so where you know it, it, am i surprised yes i am uh but at the same time i understood how it happened because it wasn't like the flat earth clues was the only thing out there once you got the flat earth clues you understood the concept the core concept and then you could go backwards then you could like, oh, okay, now I'll look at Eric's stuff. Now I'll look at Matt's stuff. Now I'll look at Cesar and Jay Henning Caligia and those guys. Because that was just, it was just too hard. It was, if you treat it like a university, Flat Earth Clues is 101. And yeah, you gave people a gateway to the Yeah, story, right? and so then they worked backwards, and then by that time, then there were people making, there was started, people started making more and more content. And then the snowball started getting bigger and bigger. And then there were more introductory videos that came out, and uh, it was, and yeah, and then it became really, really fun and exciting because the community is just so enthusiastic that when you get into it, it not only just inspires you to to take a look at different look at the world. There's a lot of people that never even had a YouTube channel that started it because of this. Uh, my my favorite example was uh, um, Jaron from Jaronism. <laughs> who looked at my videos because I made it, you know, it's a cheap production. It's made with Windows Live Movie Maker. It's my my first attempt at, at video editing. And he and he's looking at this going, well, if this guy can do it. I absolutely can make a flat earth video. And now he, he's got spinoffs to his channel. I mean, if it wasn't for Jaronism, uh, Globusters wouldn't have happened. And all these, all these other guys. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And so much of this happens on YouTube. I wonder, do you think... Um is this something you know the, the idea of flat earth well yeah. was the dominant theory for a while then the you know the, the globe theory came in and everyone yeah. bought into that for, for hundreds of years and and now sort of flat earth is uh, in resurgence i mean do you think this could have happened without the kind of the age of social media and people no spoke those no it couldn't have uh social media is the new king of 
communication out there and and i know people kind of wince when they hear that it's like look radio and television had its had its decades you know it was just radio and television for the long time and even until we had it was a combination of social media and smartphones because then people could have access to it anywhere and it wasn't just for the geek you know or you know you didn't have to have a computer in your home now you can you could view this on your phones most people that watch my stuff are, are watching it on their phones so no no in fact youtube is what this is like I, how many people watch youtube a day like uh, two billion or something like that it's it's ridiculous it's it's more it's it's not it hasn't replaced television but it's augmented it to where it's television for everybody that's not that doesn't have the time to sit in front of a television which is most of us i mean i haven't sat down and, and watched anything on tv in a long time i mean almost almost everything's coming through my computer nowadays so yeah, social media is definitely the vehicle for this the combination. I'm not even on Facebook. So between Facebook, between people sharing links between Facebook and Twitter and just building their own channels, uh, yeah, it's what's happening. Uh, where do you see the movement going now? Well, right now we're almost saturated at the tier in media which we're at meaning just about every big channel in youtube has covered this topic now to where not not just abc news and and you know all the major networks on youtube uh but all the big popular channels people that have, have made careers out of youtube have have covered it so right now we're looking for the top tier of media. That's the only thing we haven't hit yet. So yeah, of course, you know, there's there's like you know Fox News runs a story, ABC News runs a story, HBO runs a story, but we haven't gotten into prime time. Meaning we had you know CNN has not run a segment, even though I was interviewed with CNN, they they killed the story. They didn't let it happen. Uh, we haven't gotten on like we yeah, I got on Good Morning Britain. But I haven't gotten on Good Morning America, which is weird. Uh, apparently, Britain's way more uh, <laughs> open-minded to that sort of thing. I mean, seriously, I've done just about every BBC thing I can do out there, uh, with the exception of flying out and, and doing... But I did do Good Morning Britain with, with Piers Morgan and with an astronaut in the studio. The um, But we haven't done that here. We haven't done any of the American stations. We haven't done... It hasn't been turned into a documentary yet, which is going to happen this weekend. There are no television shows on Flat Earth yet. And that's what we're kind of kind of leading into. We've 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 literally flooded social media so much that the only thing left for us to do is go into mainstream, full full blown mainstream. And once that happens, well, then I think you know potentially the world changes. I don't know. It's 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 we're in uncharted territory. So, I mean, I'd love to see some sort of disclosure, although realistically, that's not how it works. You know, it's not like NASA is going to be involved in this massive class action lawsuit because it's too big to fail, like AIG and, and some of the others. So where do you spin it from there? Do you cr create something that's surreal? I mean, do you, do you stage a fake alien invasion? Do you sta stage some uh, uh, alien contact? You know, something, something to distract people or tie it in because, uh, because we have had almost no resistance from social media. I mean, if you wanted to shut down flat earth, you could, you could do it pretty easy. You could, you could stunt it to, you know, just by search engines. You could say, don't let it show up in search engines when you're typing in things. Don't recommend it to, don't recommend it to people on YouTube. Don't, you know, you can classify it as a different thing, but the, they're doing the, the, the resistance we're getting is token at best. Even Neil deGrasse Tyson coming out on television and saying flat earth isn't real for seven minutes uh, without using any graphics or movies or anything is like, really, that's not your a game. Why, why are you so doing Why that? do you think they aren't trying harder to shut it down? Are Cause they, I think it's, it case? I think it's part of a bigger plan. I, I think so, that they want the information to leak out slowly. I think eventually they, they, that was always part of the deal. You hide it, you bury it in the sixties and then you decide, okay, we're going to, we, we, we gotta have a way to introduce to the public to where we spin the story. And, and you know get our get the you know the old criminal saying get the story straight and that's where we are kind of what you mentioned we we are there right now you couldn't just do it with television you couldn't just do it with 
high speed internet, you need social media in place, intact. And it's about, you know, everybody's got their freaking phones. There's what, 7 billion people in the world. And there's 6 billion phones. Uh, you know, the, all the networks are in place. Literally, you could, you could release a story into the world now and everyone would have it within minutes. So everything's ready for it. If you wanted to, I, so what I, I tell people, I go, look, flat earth is just the frame for whatever's on the canvas. The canvas, we haven't seen what's on there yet. It, whatever it is though, is going to make flat earth small by comparison. And there's only a few things that I can even think of that could be along those lines. And one of them, of course, would be uh, some introduction to an older version of us, to an ancient civilization, to something something surreal that it's out of a sci-fi movie. And people say, oh, no, it's too weird. It's like, really? Because I'm here talking about Flat Earth right now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> how crazy and i and i've been doing this for three years so how if it's any crazier than that you know look i start my day with super crazy <laughs> well it's exciting times definitely yeah uh, mark uh, that's um that's great thank you for chatting to me uh, can i just yeah. um chat i just want to check some mention um, just some quick details about you before i let you go sure so you you um you mentioned that um you spent uh, a number of years as um sort of teaching people proprietary software yeah and then um, i read um somewhere i think it was a conference bio or something you, you started out playing computer games professionally Is that i did i did i w was very fortunate again lot, lots of guys love to play this was game. ahead of your time i mean that's normal. yeah this was um, this is before <laughs> playing games for a living was even really a thing what was your game? Uh, the, it was it was a pinball game. Out of all things, it was a computer simulation of a pinball game. I won a tournament with the, this little company out of Colorado because most of the video game companies are in Southern California or Northern California. And this little company out of Colorado called Starplay, they ran this tournament. the The producer or the 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 developer was in Tokyo, and the uh, the producer was in Boulder, Colorado. And they ran this little tournament, and the, and I won it. it. It was worldwide, and we uh, and I I played th against thousands of people, and and it ran for an entire year. And I won the I won the tournament, and part of my prize was to review one of their next games. And I wrote this scathing review. They sent me a beta copy of it, and I hated it. It was, it was another pinball game. I go, man, you need to change this and this and this and this and this, because I was naturally a, a good pinball player before it became digital. And so I, I well, had a, like the, uh, the kind of handheld things where it was just like one game for each, like, it wasn't like it was played on a console. This is like where, no, no, you played it on your like PC individual. Oh, PC, right, P right. you played on your PC. And oh, it, yeah. so it was, it was for Macintosh and, and PC. There was no console version of it. Cause I think I remember those pinball PC. I'd forgotten about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This, this one was fun. It was, it was the, the pinball game was called crystal Caliburn. I think little wing, the, the developer, I think they're still doing their thing out in Japan. But okay. I, I played that. Uh, they they the, the the point was the developer saw my notes and he said, "Yeah, this guy's pretty much right on." And the uh, the developer find or I'm sorry, the the producer called me and said, "Hey, why don't you come out for an interview in in Colorado?" So I flew out in the middle of a snowstorm, never been to Colorado before, and uh, interviewed with them and got on and and I played with them for a few years. And then they finally hung it up after a weird arbitration thing, ironically, between that Tokyo developer and them. And then I jumped over. Boulder was just a great place. So you were like testing games for them at this point? I was not just testing games. I was playing games at conventions. Uh, you know, I would, I would sit there and literally at the conventions, like at Macworld, Boston, and San Francisco, and E3, I would sit, sit and play these games and make them you know, look better than they actually were. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, like anything. Job. Yeah, yeah. I was a ringer. And then I would hire talent for, I was also a producer. I would hire talent for upcoming games you know so somebody would say i i'd say okay you know this particular game could 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 go mainstream uh we need to hire a music guy and a graphics guy and 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 put these people together and that was really fun and so we we did what we could and and again it was a small shop but we we did okay and then finally we closed up and then i jumped down literally down the street to uh my first time at attendance company and because Boulder was just a great uh, back in the late 90s, mid 90s and all the way through, I don't know, 2010. It was just a fantastic place to do startup tech companies. And yeah. so that's that's what I did. So, yeah. But yeah, playing video games for a living also helped me because I was a lifelong gamer. 
it it helped me kind of open your mind up to certain things. If you play enough games, the big games that are out there, the, the giant, massive multiplayer games, you realize what can be done with simulations and what can be faked. And you can see the developing of the technology, how the sky changes and the resolution changes and how physics engines work. And, and you realize after a while, you start thinking, if you play them long enough, you, you start thinking, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> what's the difference between where what I'm playing and where I'm sitting? Sitting. And it's like it's just like okay, better resolution, a few more senses. That's about it. So at that yeah. point, you know, and then of course the movies come out, like The Matrix and the Thirteenth Floor, and and all the all the you know Inception and all all the different po possible you know virtual realms, and you realize that what we define as reality eh, is own you know it, it's yeah. <laughs> it's an opinion. <laughs> so um, and can I ask how old you are now, Mark? I am 49, and I'm I'm actually turning uh, 50 here real soon. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, and um, and what do you do for a living now? Are you, are you sort of spreading the word about flat Earth? I do this. Your job now? Yeah, I I do this now. Uh, not making a ton until this thing gets turned into a television show or a movie or whatever it is. But yeah, that's what I do. I, I make some money off the book. I make some money from YouTube make some money from the radio show and how can I not do this it, it when it when it came to me it, it came completely unsolicited people just kept coming to me and saying oh this is there was so much positive reinforcement that I don't think I could quit now if I wanted to unless of course it was proven absolutely wrong which well if it hasn't happened by now uh, it's gonna be kind of tough because we've got you know several years of foundation built and uh, I have yet to have an academic call me up. N no one. In fact, I asked a, a friend of mine who who has a PhD, and I said, "What? Uh, you know, why am I not getting academics?" And he said, "Are you kidding?" I go, "Do you know how much time and money when you're in the academic world? How much money you spend on your education? You're going to risk that trying to go up against flat Earth? You know, <laughs> what if? You, yeah, because remember, if you go up against flat Earth and you don't beat it in first round." you know use a boxing reference uh, if you don't beat it in the first round all of a sudden you're going to be questioned it's like how have you not knocked out flat earth in the first round hey like, why are they still standing how you know fifth round six rounds like how are you not taking these guys down and yeah so the the academic world has a really tough time addressing this because no one wants to be that guy uh, I'll, I'll i'll leave it with this there was um a georgetown astrophysics professor who said who wanted to do a debate with me and a German television team was putting it together and I would, they, they did it really civilized to where I would read questions into a video monitor. They would record that and then send that video to him and he would, you know, address them and, and then, you know, we'd just bounce back and forth. Right. I sent hmm. the questions, the five, I had just five quick questions and he folded like a card table and that was it. The, the debate never even, never even took place because he's like, yeah, I'm not doing this. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Um, Mark, I really appreciate the time. Thank you.